As we approach the one-year anniversary of the Capitol riots tomorrow, our next guest has emerged as one of the key faces of the post-insurrection period and investigation. Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland became an impeachment manager in the trial against former President Trump and is now on the January 6th Select Committee in the House. All of this, of course, came after Raskin lost his son Tommy to suicide just one week before the Capitol was attacked. Raskin is now out with a new book chronicling that whirlwind period between his son's passing and the impeachment, unthinkable trauma, truth, and the trials of American democracy. Congressman Raskin, kind enough to join us now. Thank you so much for joining us, Congressman. I'm delighted to be with you. And so you write that both your 25-year-old son's death and the January 6th insurrection were cosmically distinct but intertwined in your experience and your psyche. How so? Well, as you noted, we lost Tommy on the last day of uh, 2020 on New Year's Eve, um, and one week later, the day after we buried Tommy in a small family COVID-19 graveside service, we had the violent insurrection at the Capitol and the attempt to overthrow the 2020 presidential election by Donald Trump. Speaker Pelosi asked me to be the lead impeachment manager over in the Senate for the trial. And I describe in the book how, to me, that was throwing me a lifeline because I felt like I was drowning and that I might not ever do anything again. And you talk about, again, as you just referenced, how you took the mantle of lead impeachment manager after your family, though, had expressed concerns for your safety and becoming a public face for the impeachment. What spurred you to immediately say yes in spite of what you had just dealt with just a few weeks prior with your own son's death? Tommy was a young man of extraordinary moral and political passions. Um, he hated violence and he hated fascism and authoritarianism. And uh, I know he would have uh, been appalled at what took place on January the 6th. And I felt like I had an obligation to do it, that Tommy would be completely with me the whole way. And this was a chance to try to stand up and articulate uh, not just my love, but our family's love of our constitution and our freedom and our democracy and the idea of human rights, the opposite of everything that was on display on January 6th. And turning now to the investigation and your work on the January 6th Select Committee, we've seen attempts certainly to rewrite the history of January 6th and the gravity of that day. How confident are you that your committee will be able to produce results that aren't just dismissed or ignored by Americans who've already moved on from what happened that day? Well, I think actually most Americans are still profoundly interested in what happened to us and why and how it was organized and who paid for it and what we need to do to defend ourselves in the future against an attack like that. Um, I am feeling more and more optimistic every day, Lindsay, that we are going to get to the truth. Um, the vast majority of people we've called as witnesses have come and testified voluntarily, have done interviews with the committee, and we are getting the evidence we need in order to tell a comprehensive and fine-grained portrait about what took place and how it happened and what we need to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. And toward the end of the book, you describe January 6th as, and I want to quote here, a bloody day of sedition, insurrection, and attempted coup that constitutes an action-packed advertisement for what government in America could easily become in this century. The chairman of the Capitol Police Union said that they have never seen a threat environment quite like the one that they are experiencing right now. You've also said recently that you think January 6th wasn't the end of something, but rather the beginning. What concerns you most going forward about the threats to our democracy? There were three rings of activity that happened on that day, Lindsay, and one was this mass protest that became a violent riot. The second middle ring was the ring of the insurrection, which was the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Aryan Nations, the militia groups, the QAnon networks, people who had trained for violence and launched the attack but the scariest ring, the inner ring, was the ring of the coup. This was a coup organized by the president against the vice president and against the Congress. It's what the political scientists call a self-coup, where the president turns against the constitutional structure and the electoral machinery of the government to try to 
continue his own power. And that's what happened. Donald Trump decided to try to seize the presidency. And so there was a riot surrounding an insurrection, surrounding a coup uh, against Vice President Pence, who on that day was a great constitutional patriot and refused to bow down to Donald Trump. But they are putting the apparatus of insurrection in place every day in lots of states across the country to try to guarantee the victory of Donald Trump if and when he comes back again in 2024. I want to turn back to your personal tragedy within your own family for a moment here. Obviously, uh, we know that you've been processing the loss of Tommy over the past year. If you're willing, is there anything that you hope that any other parents who are trying to navigate the grief of, of losing their child or who have a child struggling with their mental health, that, that they might be able to take away from your story? I do hope that people in their families will talk about mental health and will talk specifically about suicide. You know, in the book, I say that I, I fault myself very much for not speaking much more openly and much more frequently about suicide. But I think I was afraid the way a lot of parents are that we invest the word with too much power and that we you know, don't want to conjure it into being. But in truth, it's quite the reverse. If you don't speak it, it gives it too much power. So I certainly wish we had talked a lot more about suicide and that we all talk about it because um, it's not a bad word. It's just a very bad idea. It's something that people shouldn't do because we're all on the path of life together. But we do need to talk about it as a reality. Some good insight there. And lastly for you, Congressman, you're right about how Tommy left a brief suicide note. If you could recount what he said there and how that message guides you today. Tommy said... Please forgive me, my illness won today. Look after each other, the animals and the global poor for me. All my love, Tommy. By asking us to forgive him, Tommy gave us the gift of forgiving us in a way because we have been racked with guilt and um, self-doubt and self-cross-examination, obviously, ever since it happened. But what he was saying was that he had a disease and although he was the most brilliant of uh, young people and he had great passions as a poet, as a playwright, as a student at Harvard Law School, um, still he was overcome with this disease. Um, and it's no less of a disease than cancer or leukemia, depression uh, kills. And so we need to get people into treatment and get people um, the best medical treatment possible and then to continue to talk and to listen um, to people. Congressman Raskin, we thank you so much for your time. Unthinkable trauma, truth, and the trials of American democracy is now available wherever books are sold. And a reminder for anyone thinking about suicide or perhaps worried about a friend or loved one, you can reach the National Suicide Prevention Hotline 24 hours a day at 1-800-273-8255. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.